Hello and welcome to the 2021 MOS Virtual Convention. My name is Matt Felprin. Thank you for joining me today for my presentation. I'm a director at the Patuxent Bird Club, which is the Prince George's County chapter of MOS. I am the roving naturalist with Nova Parks in Northern Virginia, as well as a part-time naturalist at Patuxent River Park in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. I was born and raised in Montgomery County, Maryland, and still live in Silver Spring today. Um, but my, my full-time job is in Arlington, so it's a pretty short commute across the river, and from there I travel throughout Loudoun, Fairfax, and Arlington counties to do environmental education and recreational uh, programming. So if you have any questions about that or how I got to where I am today, please feel free to ask me in the Q&A section directly following this presentation, and feel free to take any notes if there's anything that you'd like to ask me about any particular slide, photo, bird, technique, or anything like that um, after the program. Uh, so as a naturalist, a birder, and a photographer, I've kind of found a niche of combining these three skill sets to use photography as an educational tool. Um, to people who may not know too much about birds or who are learning about birds um, and just kind of just the wonders of the natural world around us. You know, a lot of people don't realize what kind of natural treasures we have even in such a congested area. So um, that's, that's going to be a major topic today, birding in the area as well as birding during the pandemic. Um, so 2020 was obviously a challenging year for everybody. It brought some challenges as well as some new discoveries for me. Um, so we'll definitely be talking about that during this presentation. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in because I've got a ton of slides. So we'll go ahead and get started. So while we'll definitely be seeing a variety of birds in this presentation, I really want to highlight the warblers uh, because 2020 was my best warbler year to date. I have a lot of birders to thank for that, for helping me uh, get on some of the tougher ones. Um, and then also having the uh, time to go out and find them because I was furloughed from late April to late July um, due to COVID. So I definitely took full advantage of of that spare time and spent a lot of time in the field looking for some of the more difficult warblers to find. They really are amazing animals and we're lucky to be able to see so many of them here in the eastern United States as they migrate through to their breeding grounds and then some of them which um, grace us with their presence uh, during breeding season. Um, so here are the warblers that I was able to observe and photograph in 2020. Every warbler that I saw in 2020, I was able to photograph. That's 33 species of warblers. Um, not all of the photos are great, <laughs> so you'll definitely be seeing some of the better ones in this presentation, but I was able to, um, again, photograph 33 warbler species, so I was very excited about that. And then I added an additional thing right here, 2021, I, um, I got two more lifers, uh, one being the um, elusive golden-winged warbler. That was definitely my nemesis bird until I was able to see it um, a few weeks ago at Wheaton Regional Park in Silver Spring, uh, very close to my home, actually. And I traveled down to southeastern Virginia to the Great Dismal Swamp where I got to see Swainson's warbler. I don't really count that as being the greater D.C. metro area, but it's it's close enough. So I've, I've now seen all of the expected warblers in the eastern United States, not counting the Kirtland's warbler. Um, so we're going to basically stick just to the east coast, <laughs> but I'll see that eventually. So um, I know it's hidden down here, but there was an asterisk here saying breeding confirmed. So I was able to see a lot of um, breeding evidence from many of the warblers last year in 2020. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, kind of do this thing chronologically. So um, it'll be, you know, from winter to winter um, of, of 2020 down to the uh, winter of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. Um, so we're going to start with some waterfowl. By the way, this was taken in Silver Spring, right near the Trader Joe's off of Colesville Road um, in Northwest Branch. Um, and apparently Teddy Roosevelt used to take his uh, horse up here when he was president and apparently went skinny dipping in the fall. So <laughs> there's a nice, neat little fact there about Northwest Branch. Here we have a beautiful male northern pintail. Um, this is at Huntley Meadows Park in Alexandria, Virginia. You'll see a few other photos from that park, especially in this um, winter set. 
Uh, this, I believe this was in late afternoon with golden hour light. Um, in order to get a shot like this, I'm doing a, a lot of laying on my belly on the boardwalk to be able to get some of the, um, you want to get some of the horizon line in the background. Um, that's definitely a major goal in photography. So I'll definitely be talking about um, some, some techniques that I use in order to capture some of these photos, um, including composition um, and shutter speed and other settings like that. Um, and so yeah, this pintail was doing a nice little stretch and he just looks so cute. You can obviously see the, the namesake pintail right on the back of him there. Here is another photo of him. Um, totally upright and just looking gorgeous and I just love the way that the, the light is hitting his eye right there and the blurry background again which which I get by um, by distancing the background as far as I can from my subject um, and that's what gives it the nice bokeh there which is another word which is a Japanese term that, that basically just means blurry background um, but the pintail himself is is in perfect focus. Here's a male northern shoveler preparing for landing. Uh, this is also at Huntley Meadows Park in Alexandria, and I really recommend going to visit this park, especially now that we're almost out of the woods with COVID. Um, it was definitely challenging to go there to bird and photograph during COVID because um, most of the action takes place on a small, narrow boardwalk meandering through the marsh and swamp. Um, so that could definitely be a challenge, um, especially when not everybody was wearing masks. Um, but I will say that in the winter of 2020, when this, when I took this photo, um, especially on the colder days, um, it wasn't too crowded. It wasn't so bad. I will say that this past winter, especially in January 2021, uh, was definitely nuts because there were several um, young river otters that were seen there, and uh, it definitely caused quite a frenzy. Um, there's something to see almost any time of year at Huntley Meadows. Um, right now you would get Prothonotary Warbler, Eastern Bluebird, uh, barn, lots of Barn Swallows, um, and Red-Headed Woodpecker all breeding right now at that park. Um, but the real calling is the, is the waterfowl that are present there in winter. Um, it is pretty amazing. And so this is just one shot in a sequence of shots of this shoveler landing. Um, Luckily, I was able to get almost the entire sequence sharp and in focus, which is uh, not always easy to do. And so I created what is called a composite image, uh, which follows. So a composite image is a um, several photos that have been uh, kind of stitched together, which definitely provides challenges, especially in getting the background to look right. Um, so it is not an easy thing to do, but it really kind of shows motion in a way that a single photograph can't always convey. So it shows you here, um, this is seven different photographs that I put together showing the landing sequence of this um, northern shoveler. And the most interesting thing to me is watching the body swing forward in order to break when it hits the water. So watch here as the body is, is slanted this way and the feet are back and then the bird swings the feet forward uh, to brace for landing and then you've got the splash down at the end. So I really do enjoy this composite photograph here. Speaking of interesting techniques in photography, this is um, something called panning. And while um, photographers pan all the time to take photos of um, subjects in motion, um, this is a special type of panning um, that deals with low light and slow shutter speed. So when I lose enough light in the day, um, either due to weather or time of day, um, for, for the most part that means there's no more bird photography to be had. Um, but there is a special exception when it comes to birds moving from left to right or right to left uh, at near eye level, um, which allows you to track the bird on a, on a straight plane. Um, and you can use a slow shutter speed to kind of make it look like, um, like super speed here, uh, like warp speed with the background, how the background kind of just like blurs together um, side to side and then also notice the wings how when the wings go up and down you can almost see the actual movement of the wings mo uh, moving up and down flapping um, so I think that um, you know it's it's a great it's a great time to take advantage of this technique especially when you have 
the birds and the settings um, to pull it off. It is very challenging to be able to, because you know you really need to at least get the head in, in focus and sharp and not blurry. So as long as you've got the head and most of the body um, kind of intact there, I think that you can pull this off very well. I believe this was at 1 20th of a second, um, which gives you almost no room for error. So you have to be locked on uh, and be able to track the bird exactly and keep them in frame perfectly. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to look like a blurry mess. Um, so it is a really fun technique that I highly recommend taking advantage of when you lose light in the day. And obviously, these are Canada geese. Um, and so here was actually my first ever look at a razor bill. Um, and they remind me of the penguin from Batman. Um, because of their really cool wings, and obviously they kind of look penguin-like, although they're obviously more related to puffins than anything else. They're um, in the Alcid family. Um, this was at Indian River Inlet in Delaware, so while not quite the D.C. metro area, we're going to give it an exception here. Um, and uh, inlets um, along the Atlantic coast can be really productive in the winter for some cool birds and uh, to, to show up, including some... Um, pelagic birds such as razorbill and um, I was just so lucky to get this to see this bird so close to me there was actually two of them uh, here are the two right here and they were uh, swimming in the inlet together very close to the jetty that I was on and they were diving and presumably finding some fish and crabs and munching them down and so I was very lucky to be able to see them um, in Delaware that day here are those kind of swept wings that you can see that remind me of the penguin in Batman. Uh, just so cool to observe this bird foraging. Also, um, in the same inlet, uh, Indian River Inlet, we've got so, uh, a beautiful pair of long-tailed ducks. And uh, the male is truly a show-off there with his pink-orange eyes and that pink and black bill. And, of course, you can't forget the super long tail. Um, I just, I just really love going to, I love going to the ocean at all times of year. Um, and I never would have thought as a kid that I would have loved to go to the ocean in, uh, the blistering cold of winter, especially cause it can be so, uh, windy. Um, but I find it really awesome to go, um, to the coast, uh, in winter for birding, uh, because you see a lot of cool stuff there that you're not going to see any other time of year. Long tailed ducks are among my, one of my favorites. This is a black-chinned hummingbird. Um, I was very lucky to be invited to go see this bird. Um, I believe this was a Maryland state record. They had been seen in D.C. before and right across the Potomac in, I believe, either Virginia or West Virginia. But I believe this is the first one recorded and reported in Maryland. And this was in St. Mary's County. Um, and so it was, it was Quite the sight to see. It's not the best photo, but I was able. I was lucky to be able to see it at all, and uh, it was one of my favorite rarities to to see in 2020. And um, here we have a bald eagle um, bringing up some sort of shad. I can't tell if it's an American shad or a gizzard shad, um, but this is what one of my parks in uh, Northern Virginia that I work that I work at. This is this is at Pohick Bay Regional Park in Lorton, Virginia which is a great place to observe uh, bald eagle and ospreys in their uh, natural habitat. In fact, most of the ospreys there um, actually breed um, on natural nests uh, rather than uh, artificial platforms because I actually installed a few and only one of them is being occupied. Um, they prefer their dead trees uh, to nest on. <laughs> but it's a great place to observe eagles in the winter, um, especially in February. And this was actually right after a meeting that I had. I went down to uh, the marina just to see what was out there. And sure enough, here comes this eagle with its lunch um, showing off right in front of me. I'm, luckily, I got there at the right time with my camera, had my settings ready to go, and boom. Uh, and I listed off a few shots as the bird came in to enjoy its lunch. And um, no, the bird is not choking here. It almost looks like the fish is like its tongue. Um, after it was about halfway done um, picking at the fish, it just decided to swallow the rest whole. But I just love the the way that this looks. It almost looks like the like it's like a snake-like tongue on this eagle. 
and got to clean up afterwards. So there it is, um, preening and rubbing its bill on the piling here. And off it goes. Um, so again, I love observing eagles at Pohick Bay. And in April, when we have a lot of, um, in like, I guess like early April, when there's still a lot of osprey migrating through, um, I, I enjoy watching the battles that ensue between the bald eagles and the ospreys as they fight over the fish in Pohick Bay. Um, it's definitely a great place to enjoy watching dogfights of these major um, large raptors. Pretty cool stuff. So as a warbler lover, of course, I was thrilled to find out that there was an overwintering yellow-throated warbler at East Potomac Park in D.C., and um, I, I grabbed a few photos of this bird as it was foraging around in trees at the golf course parking lot. And I'm sure a lot of people who were going golfing um, were wondering, you know, why the hell is this guy walking around with his, his big camera set up in a parking lot? Um, and of course it was this pretty little bird that was putting on a show uh, and that was the reason. And so as you can see here, there are still insects to find hidden underneath the bark of some of these trees. So it still had plenty to eat. And, um, and I believe this bird was actually, uh, I believe it must have been the same bird that overwintered um, in the winter of 2021. Um, in addition to several other um, unexpected warbler species that time of year, um, many of whom were thriving off of aphids um, that were attracted to um, a Japanese clematis plant. So it's interesting to see that some insects were hosted by non-native plants that were able to, to keep a population of warblers going. So that was kind of a really neat discovery that many um, DC birders uh, were tuned into. Uh, it was uh, great to be able to see warblers in the winter for me as somebody who just obviously loves these birds so much. And here he is in his full glory. Um, I really love the inquisitive look of this bird in this photo um, and, and kind of the gleam on his eye as he, he looks at me um, wondering why I'm watching him eat lunch. So now we'll get into spring. This photo is um, actually not from the area at all. It is I just love it so much. It's uh, Catawba Falls outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and I just I just really enjoy this photo. Got to kick it off with some cherry blossoms, um, and uh, it appears that this male house finch is playing the cherry blossom trumpet here. Um, it's really interesting behavior watching these finches pick off these flowers and, and mostly just discarding them as if they're trolling cherry blossom fans, um, picking off all the flowers. So here's the male house finch and the female house finch here um, picking the cherry blossom flowers. Um, it was definitely entertaining to watch. This was right outside my apartment complex in Silver Spring. Um, so again, taking advantage of birding during COVID and just finding things that are around where you live. Here was one of the first ospreys I had seen of the year in March of 2020. And um, this osprey was uh, seen at Huntley Meadows. It is clearly an adult male with no brown necklacing around the chest. Um, and uh, he, I believe, caught two goldfish that I saw that day. Um, they really do love goldfish. And these aren't goldfish that were released from, you know, or were flushed down the toilet or, or won at a carnival. Goldfish have actually been in the Chesapeake Bay watershed for uh, several hundred years now. And um, as someone who observes osprey a lot, I've, I've noticed that it's one of their favorite foods. It must be pretty easy to see a bright orange fish when you're hovering over the water. Um, and one of the first warblers to show up um, in the eastern woodlands, here's a Louisiana water thrush um, singing a beautiful tune in April of 2020. This was in Wheaton um, near the Brookside Nature Center, which is one of my favorite places to go um, to observe early warblers and other migrants um, because it's so close to home and it's a beautiful little trail. Here we have a, um, an adult barred owl at Dyke Marsh in Alexandria, um, and they've been raising families there for several years now. They had another brood this year, and they are really good parents because they seem to always have like, three offspring that successfully fledge 
every year, which is a good sign for that species. Um, and uh, they really put on a show every evening after the owls fledge the nest, and um, and you can usually observe them right next to the trail um, as the owlets are kind of playing around, playing with each other and and picking at branches and and learning what it's like to be an owl, and the adults bringing them back food. I actually saw them eating cicadas this year, which was pretty cool. I really do enjoy um, birding from Chain Bridge, which connects DC to Arlington. It is part of my daily commute, so sometimes I'll pull over in one of the parking spots and and go birding there. It's it's just an excellent vantage point overlooking the Potomac Gorge, um, seeing all these giant boulders and and just looking down at this beautiful landscape. You'd hardly tell that you're in such a a busy area when you're looking down on the Potomac. From Chain Bridge, especially on a dramatic sunrise or sunset, um, it's it's one of my it's probably the favorite part of my commute uh, daily. Um, so, in April last year, um, during one of my last days um, before my furlough, um, enjoying this osprey here with the shad, um, almost at eye level as I watched it pick the fish out of the Potomac River. Another really interesting thing about Chain Bridge is that it um, hosts uh, the first pair of breeding common raven observed in Washington, D.C. for, I believe, over 100 years. And they've been nesting there for several years now. Um, but it is a, it's a really cool thing to see ravens in D.C. And again, this is part of my commute. This is how I get to work. So see a raven on the way to work. Uh, is, is pretty cool. Uh, they are really majestic, um, incredibly intelligent birds, so I really, I really enjoy seeing ravens. This was uh, one, of the, one of the more shocking rarities to, to kick off migration season uh, to see a scissor-tailed flycatcher, and I believe this was in Elkridge, Maryland, um, so it was in Anne Arundel County, and um, this is like pretty much right when my furlough first started, so I had the time to just zip right up and observe the bird um, and and was probably watching it for a couple hours as it would hover over the baseball fields there and fly catch. Um, and it was associating itself with several eastern kingbirds, and they would kind of get in a scuffle sometimes, but then they would still all kind of congregate together. Um, so watching the behavior between the flycatcher species uh, was was pretty interesting to me. So the reason why I've highlighted one particular park is because I saw 21 warbler species in 2020 at this one little park, neighborhood park in Alexandria, Virginia. It's kind of a hidden gem. It's not the Monticello that uh, Thomas Jefferson lived at. It is, it is right there in Alexandria, and it's only a few acres. Um, but because of the mature uh, trees that are there in the shallow stream that they can bathe in. Um, there's there's also termite hatches that happen there every May. There's plenty of food to eat. It's a great place to rest for these birds. And along their flyway, the mature, the, the tall mature canopies really stick out to these birds as they're flying overhead. So it really is a warbler paradise. But I don't believe there's any breeding warblers there. It's strictly for migrants. Um, so. Definitely a cool place to check out in early and mid-May. Again, 21 species I saw there, and here are some of them. Um, here, here are some photographs of a few of these warblers that I saw at Monticello. So here we have a beautiful male Cape May warbler. Um, kind of a perfect example of uh, why lots of common names are are pretty bad, because <laughs> this bird does not breed anywhere near Cape May, and was probably seen there once during migration and got the label Cape May Warbler, um, though its Latin name Cetophaga tigrina definitely would um, kind of encapture this bird's beauty a little bit better with these cool little tiger stripes on its chest and belly. Um, and this is also um, a great example talking about uh, photography challenges with photographing warblers as they are really small, really fast, and typically pretty far away, not to mention under a lot of cover in the, um, and shaded by the foliage. Also, there's obstructions like twigs and stuff that get in the way all the time. Um, so I would say that 
warbler photography is definitely among the most challenging of any types of photography there is out there. Please give me an example of anything that's tougher than that. Um, it's 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 really hard, but it's it's so rewarding when you're able to get a a, a usable photo of one of these beautiful birds. And so here's an example. Um, Typically, I'll have to, in order to pull this off um, in, in, the, in the conditions that I'm shooting in, I have to keep um, my shutter speeds very slow um, so that I don't make the noise, uh, the image um, super noisy from high ISO usage, uh, which is basically an introduction of artificial light into your photo to make up for a lack of light. If you have any more questions about camera settings or techniques um, that can be asked in the Q&A, but I, I will spare you the photography lesson um, in this presentation. Um, just know that for a lot of these warblers, I'm shooting at really slow shutter speeds, sometimes as slow as 1 50th, 1 60th of a second. This was probably taken at 1 1 25th of a second, which um, for a tiny fast moving subject is, is a very slow shutter speed. Um, but again, necessary if I want to if I want to capture that detail um, without it getting too noisy. And um, while these birds do move around and look around a lot, um, you know they they they'll spend a, a split second completely still, and then hopefully as I as I hold down the shutter, one of the shots is going to be uh, perfectly sharp. So here's an example of of a success story of the Cape May warbler. The best thing about birding Monticello Park is the shallow stream that runs through um, where a lot of these birds will come down to bathe. Uh, most of the time, the stream is shaded, <laughs> so uh, photography is, is very limited um, and you kind of just got to get lucky. Um, now, being furloughed, I was able to go to this park almost every single day, so I took full advantage um, of the time I had and observed all these warbler species um, and some really interesting behavior, uh, foraging uh, and bathing, um, which was just really cool to see. Here we have a northern perula um, getting stared down by uh, an American goldfinch male. Um, and you can see um, in this photo how, how um, much smaller the perula is from the goldfinch, which is in the background and still is bigger uh, than the perula. Um, so they do, they do, they will share their space, their bathing space, but the uh, goldfinch doesn't look too pleased, does he? This was one of the coolest finds I had at Monticello. Um, it is actually a melanistic black and white warbler. Um, and so as you can see, his head is almost entirely black. Um, and it definitely took me for a spin when I first saw it, wondering, like, what the heck is this thing? Um, but I quickly put two and two together and realized that it was a, uh, a melanistic black and white warbler. Um, really, really striking. I don't know if I'll ever see one again, so I really treasured watching it. And I was, I was there by its side as long as it would hang out with me, <laughs> all of about five minutes. Um, I did get to see it go down and bathe, which was really cool. But again, one of the highlights of Monticello last spring. Here we have an adult female magnolia warbler bathing in the stream. Um, and I know this past May was pretty cool, but uh, there were some hotter days in May 2020. And on some of those days, I wanted to be jumping right in the water with them. Here we have an adult male black-throated blue warbler posing gracefully over the stream on this picturesque little pebble. Um, and like most warbler species, or like many warbler species, the females look nothing like the male. In fact, they, um, uh, for decades, they were considered another species until it was realized that it was a female of the same species. Um, and the, the, one, I, the one major field mark that will help you identify um, black-throated blue females in the field is that they also have this small white wing patch, um, affectionately known as a handkerchief. So be on the lookout for that little white patch on the wing, which gives away um, the much more drab, black-throated blue female as a black-throated blue warbler. Another look here at the male black-throated blue warbler. Here we have a worm-eating warbler, and while not as striking as some of the other warblers that you'll see, um, this was a very special moment to me because it was the first time I had photographed one, um, and at some points it was no more than three feet away from me. 
Um, and while Monticello is typically a very busy park, I had this moment all to myself watching this bird catching insects all around me. Um, definitely a very special moment. Here we have a male bay-breasted warbler really enjoying himself in this beautiful sunny patch in the stream. Um, and I was all over this because, again, um, not having many opportunities to photograph these birds in good light, um, I was very lucky to be able to see this bird. Um, sometimes what, so what you're not really getting, um, you know, just by seeing some of these photos as fast as I'm going through them is how long I'm literally sitting there at this park waiting for stuff to happen. Um, and I position myself where there's good light, um, which is changing throughout the day. Um, just waiting for some something to fly down and bathe. Um, and so again, uh, having all the spare time that I had really allowed me to take full advantage of the photography opportunities at Monticello. Um, you could go in there for an hour and, and, and leave with some good stuff, but really it does take a time investment in order to get opportunities like this. Here we have a female bay-breasted warbler. As you can see, she looks nothing like the male. Um, but she's she's cute in her own right, and so I can't just be biased and show males. Here's a pretty little female bay-breasted warbler. So I included a couple short video clips. Here's the male bay-breasted warbler bathing in the stream. Please forgive the camera shake because um, I'm shooting handheld, uh, no tripod, and at those focal lengths, it's unforgiving. Um, so please forgive the little bit of camera shake. I hope you don't get dizzy watching. Um, but he's really enjoying himself here in the, in the stream. Figured I'd have to include this. I wish there was some music that went along with it. That would have made it perfect. Here we have a male black pole warbler, not to be confused with the black and white warbler. Uh, they've got a distinctive black cap and white cheek, as well as the orange feet and legs, which separate them from the black and white warbler. They undergo, they undergo one of the longer migration routes of any uh, eastern wood warbler, um, migrating from South America to the boreal forests of Canada. Um, and the, the one down thing about these birds is that it kind of single, signals the end of warbler migration. So it's kind of a gift and a curse to start to see black pole warblers. Here's a really cute photo of a black pole warbler uh, bathing. I just really love the posture. I think it's really cute. Here was my favorite photo that I took of a black-throated green warbler um, last year. Um, most of most of those photos were in really dark conditions, so to be able to get um, one right in the little pocket of light uh, was great for me. And um, I've still yet to get an amazing photo of a black-throated green, but I'll take this for now. Here we've got a male Wilson's warbler, um, which I think are kind of hilarious, but absolutely adorable at the same time. It almost looks like they're either wearing a toupee or a yarmulke. You choose. Um, but uh, one interesting technique that I did use for this photo is something called color drain. Um, when you're in the forest um, and there's foliage everywhere that the light is going through, it kind of kind of sh it casts a green tint on everything. Um, and so for this photo, I just completely removed all green color from the photo, and um, and I thought that the bird popped a little bit more when I did that. Uh, so that is one interesting technique that I used here. This is my favorite shot that I've ever taken of a red-eyed vireo. And as many warbler uh, lovers can relate with, uh, vireos are frustrating during warbler season because they act like warblers, yet they are not warblers, so that they can dis they distract us all the time. Um, but they are still beautiful birds in their own right. And this is the best look I've ever had at one um, 
with how clear that beautiful red eye is. Typically when you're looking at them from below, um, their, their eyes don't quite pop. So seeing it at eye level, um, mere, a mere few feet away, um, was, was, was a really awesome moment. Um, this was actually during um, one of the termite hatches I had mentioned that occurs at Monticello when all of the migrants are just in a frenzy um, picking up termites on the wing um, right in front of your face on the trail. It, it really transforms Monticello into kind of like a, a jungle habitat um, for, for you know, a fleeting five to ten minutes before it's all over. Really cool thing to see. Um, and here we have a viri, which is a migrating thrush. Um, you can find breeding populations of these um, as close as Shenandoah National Park. Um, so they do breed in the mountains here, um, but you won't find them on the Piedmont or the coastal plain. Um, but I love their song. Um, one of my favorite places to go observe them, um, breeding population, is a trail called the Limberlost Trail. Um, in Shenandoah National Park right on Skyline Drive. Um, this time of year is also filled with blooming mountain laurel um, and singing scarlet tanagers, chestnut-sided warblers. Uh, so if you'd like to see viris and some of the other things I just mentioned, you'll definitely want um, to take a hike at the Limberlost Trail. And here's what I call the grand prize at the feeder in spring, uh, a male rose-breasted grosbeak. There's really no other bird in this area that, that has a true shade of pink other than the rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, and with their black head and back, uh, rose breast, and white belly, uh, they are one of the most striking birds during spring migration. Here's another look at him sitting in the stream there catching the light. Um, he knows everybody's eyes are on him. This is easily one of my favorite photos I took last spring of a male scarlet tanager um, perching on a rock about to take a bath. I just love the texture of the water behind his head. It almost looks surreal or magical. And obviously the, the bright scarlet red contrasting with the black wings. Um, these birds are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so again, one of my favorite photos from last year. This is probably one of um, the most interesting photos I took um, last spring of a Kentucky warbler gathering nesting material. And that is one long piece of grass that it has there in its bill. Um, it's the best look I've ever had at, the, at this species. This is um, at the Trillium Trail um, at Thompson uh, Wildlife Management Area in Linden, Virginia, which is a great place to go to observe Kentucky warblers as well as Cerulean warblers. Um, and again, I, I've never had a better look at a Kentucky warbler than this one. Uh, so that really stand that, that really stood out to me. Um, now I cheated a little bit. This photo is actually from this past May, um, where I got the best look at a cerulean warbler that I've had. Uh, the photo that I, that, um, I was able to get of a cerulean last year, uh, was pretty bad <laughs> and taken, um, sh shot straight under his belly. Um, so finally I was able to get an eye level look, um, at a beautiful male cerulean warbler. Um, I believe this was like my fifth trip out to the Trillium Trail and I finally got the shot that I wanted. Um, and it was well worth it. Lots of, lots of early, early, uh, days driving to the Trillium Trail looking for this shot. So this shot was actually taken, um, Barely underneath this bird, but um, the angle was such that that I was still able to get a fairly good look at, at um, his head. And I know that sounds weird, um, but these birds spend so much time in the high canopy that um, if you get any photo other than of their belly um, from a very far distance, <laughs> you consider it a success. So I was very, very grateful to be able to get two usable photos, usable and great photos of this species um, at this trip to the Trillium Trail a couple weeks ago. Here we have a hooded warbler, um, also commonly found on the Trillium Trail, but this photo is actually from one of the overlooks at Skyline Drive, which is one of my favorite places to observe hooded warblers because they're typically in uh, dense vegetation. But at the um, overlooks here, sometimes they'll be perching on some shrubs that are a little bit more sparse with foliage, so you can get some really good looks. Um, so for hooded warbler, um, indigo bunting, as well as yellow-breasted chat, some of the overlooks at, at Skyline Drive can be really productive. 
Here we have an adorable family of hooded mergansers at Hughes Hollow at McKee Besher's Wildlife Management Area in Poolsville. Um, and they're actually not very shy at this, at this um, park. Um, so it's a cool place to go observe hooded mergansers as well as um, some breeding warblers like Brithonotary, common yellowthroat. Um, a few weeks ago, there were it, it basically turned into Florida where there was an anhinga, as well as several black-bellied whistling ducks and common gallinule all together at the same time, um, and blue wing teal. So it kind of felt like Florida for a day. Um, a, a really special place, Hughes Hollow. A look in good light of chicks and mom, and here is uh, one of the chicks. Um, nibbling on a piece of arrow arum, <laughs> and, and uh, that's, that's just, it's hard to beat the cuteness on that photo there. One of the many Baltimore Orioles of Wheaton Regional Park, um, there was a pair that, that uh, had a nest right over the trail next to uh, Pine Lake last year, so it was fun to go observe them for a bit. Um, and here is a photo of the male taking out the trash, so that is a fecal sac. Um, and so as many of you probably know, um, in order to keep the nest clean and, and um, also to keep predators away, um, they will actually, uh, the uh, nestlings will actually poop in a membrane that can be easily removed and taken out like a diaper um, to, again, keep the nest clean and to keep it from smelling and attracting predators. So there's dad taking out the trash. Also at Wheaton Regional Park, here is um, Daddy Eastern Bluebird and the little fledgling to his right. I just loved the contrast of light um, in this photograph and the detail on the eye of the dad. Um, and so even though it's on a fence, um, I, I still really do enjoy this photograph. And we've got, uh, to end spring here, we've got a bunch of painted turtles all vying for position on a very small log. Just thought that was cute. Now getting into summer, uh, this photo was taken at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in D.C., um, where there are amazing lotuses in bloom in the middle of summer. So now that we're into June, all the warblers have settled in um, on territory, and they're done with migration. Um, so it became time for me to go into the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia and, and find some of these warblers on their breeding grounds. Here's a chestnut-sided warbler. Uh, we've got a blue-headed vireo. Uh, both the chestnut-sided and the blue-headed vireo are very commonly found um, in higher elevations, um, and you can you know you can find them pretty easily at Shenandoah. But uh, for this trip, I was all the way in Bluegrass, Virginia, uh, at the George Washington National Forest. Here we've got a Canada warbler, and some of these warblers. Um, typically aren't at this latitude. Typically they'll be breeding much further north, but some of the really high elevation mountains in Virginia and West Virginia um, are, are basically kind of mi uh, mimicking the climate of, um, of the northern latitudes of the northeastern United States and, and southern Canada. Um, so you're going to get um, some pockets of breeding warblers that normally wouldn't be this far south due to the elevation and climate and habitat of these mountains. Another example of that would be of the fan favorite Blackburnian warbler, easily my favorite warbler of them all, with that incredibly striking black and orange contrast of the face, as well as the black streaks and white belly um, under tail coverts of the uh, Blackburnian warbler. They're just incredible, incredible birds, and this is the best look I've ever had at one. I will never forget this moment, um, driving hours and hours up the mountain uh, to finally get to the spruce fir forest where they breed. Um, well worth the entire drive, <laughs> which was, by the way, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I had no signal. I left my home at 3 a.m. that day to get out to the breeding grounds um, on those mountains. Um, and again, had to download maps and, and, and I did this all by myself. <laughs> so no one was with me. It was just me and the birds did not, um, see another soul the entire trip, except for on the roads, on the more major roads driving. I did not see another person, um, while I was birding the whole time. 
another look at the very stoic male Black Bernie and Warbler here. This was a lifer for me, a morning warbler. I was very excited to see this bird just over the state line in West Virginia. Um, now I had a little bit of an adventure um, trying to find this bird because on the drive up to the uh, location, um, I came across a downed tree in the road. Uh, I tried to move it. Um, I'm a big, strong guy, but I'm not that strong, so I had to leave the car behind and walk the rest of the way. Luckily, it was just a little over a mile to that power line cut. Um, where they breed, so they really do uh, like to breed in power line cuts in the mountains. It's a good place to find them during breeding season. Luckily, I didn't have to walk too far. Um, all in all, this trip took about 15 hours uh, from start to finish, um, all alone, <laughs> not seeing anyone else. Um, it definitely takes a lot of stamina, and if you've got the drive and determination, um, it'll power you through because. Again, it's just an incredibly rewarding experience to see some of these birds that either I've never seen before or I've never seen so well. Um, so I will never forget this trip in mid-June uh, of 2020. Got a pretty cedar waxwing at Huntley Meadows Park. Um, another great place to go uh, during breeding season locally is Occoquan Bay National Wildlife Refuge in Woodbridge, Virginia, um, where you've got a lot of cool breeding species. So here's, it's not a warbler, but it's a white-eyed vireo. Kind of a cartoon bird because you're really not going to see any other bird with a black pupil and a white iris. So literally looks like a cartoon. Um, one of the special uh, breeding birds that they've got there are the prairie warblers that uh, are pretty numerous. Um, I just love the way that they sing as well. I'm not going to demonstrate that for you. You can look that up on your own. <laughs> but um, prairie warblers are all over that. Uh, all over that ref. Here's another photo that I stuck in um, from this year um, just because uh, this singing prairie warbler looks so dramatic like he's singing opera. And here we have my favorite heron, the least bittern. It is the smallest heron in North America and um, they are just so colorful as well. Um, they're also really tough to see out in the open. Um, this is a park where I think that um, your chances are pretty good on a on a hot day in the summer. Uh, to at least hear one, maybe get a chance to see one flying, or maybe peeking its head up in the cattails. Um, tremendous, tremendous birds. Here are two male least bitterns giving each other a chase. And um, I'll point out real quick here, it's hard to see, but um, when the males get excited in breeding season, uh, their laurel patch here actually turns cherry red. Uh, right at the base of the bill, you can kind of see that right here. And obviously, um, chasing each other is definitely going to get them excited. Here we've got the classic, why did the chicken cross the road photo? To get to the other side, of course, as there's marsh on both sides for this beautiful king rail. Um, really tough bird to find in most locations, but is, is kind of a gimme at Occoquan Bay, um, luckily. And they, they are present there all year round. Not the sharpest photo, but not the easiest one to take either. Here we have a, an Eastern, a male Eastern Bluebird with the moon in the background. I had to do some crazy camera settings to pull this off while still getting the moon somewhat in focus. because It's obviously um, quite a few miles away um, from the Bluebird. <laughs> and so when you've got a background that's so far from the subject and to get them both in focus uh, really uh, requires some manipulation. So I shot this at F, I believe like F32. For those of you who, who know what I mean, you can feel free to ask me questions later about this shot. Um, but I couldn't help it, but I cannot pass up that opportunity. Uh, that was all, that was at Huntley Meadows, as well as this photo of Prothonotary Warbler. Again, a great place to, to watch Prothonotaries during breeding season. Here's another shot of a beautiful male Prothonotary Warbler showing off all his feathers for me, um, probably about four or five feet away, <laughs> right off the trail. At McKee Beshers, it's a great place to see birds like indigo buntings at eye level, um, where they'll be perched atop sunflowers like this, um, which really is, it's hard to, it's hard to beat that electric blue um, with that sunflower yellow. This photo was actually on the cover of um, eBird uh, for a short time in, I believe, July. Um, this was during banding operations uh, at my job at Patuxent River Park, um, where I banned ospreys under um, 
Greg Kearns, who's the naturalist at Patuxent River Park. He's been there for a long time, and I've, I'm grateful to have learned a lot of what I know um, through him. And um, it's a large part of my, um, due to my work at Patuxent River Park, why osprey are my favorite species of birds, uh, because I've had lots of hands-on experience with them and seen them at all phases of life. Um, they are truly amazing birds, and I'm happy that um, Greg had a lot to do with their comeback from DDT um, in the 80s uh, at Patuxent River Park. And here's an osprey coming down for a drink of water. On that same trip, um, I spotted a rarity, which is a juvenile or an immature least tern, which was probably breeding at somewhat nearby Poplar Island. Um, it's the first one that I had um, seen at Patuxent River Park, I believe. Here he is in the air. Here we have a ruff, which is actually a, um, a bird that uh, spends most of its time in Europe and Africa. Um, yet sometimes they get blown overseas um, to North America. And this was at a small little residential pond in, um, in Chantilly, Virginia. Here we've got another rarity, um, a vagrant sedge wren, which ended up in Fairfax County. Uh, there was another one in D.C. last fall. I'm going to quickly show you a, I know that we're getting close to time here, so I'm going to show you um, quickly my welcome back to work, um, active hummingbird nest. Pretty much right as I got back to work, um, I discovered a an active hummingbird nest right behind the nature center that I work at um, and was lucky enough to observe this. This was actually the, the, the first and only um, active hummingbird nest I've ever seen. And here's mama feeding the babies. Um, and this is an American avocet, um, shaken off its feathers, and you can see the water droplets, which I thought was pretty cool. This was actually reported at, um, at Pine Lake at Wheaton Regional Park. Who would have guessed that? Typically, you'll see avocets on the shore as they migrate through. Um, but luckily, I only had to drive about seven minutes from home uh, to see this one at Wheaton Regional. And here's another look at it. Very, very large shorebirds, by the way. Right, I'll try to get through fall very quickly. This is from Shenandoah National Park. Here we have Sora banding at Jug Bay. Um, so this is a uh, first year bird. I can't tell you if it's male or female, but just by the plumage alone, I can tell you this is a hatch year bird. Um, and right there you can see that it's actually not measuring the bird's face, but if you look down, here, this is actually measuring the toe length. There's a, there's a separate um, uh, in, part of the instrument. This is called a digital caliper. And here's, uh, it's actually measuring the length of the bird's toe. And as you can see here, it's uh, about 34 millimeters. 
another look at the awkward youngling. And um, there it goes as it flies into the marsh. Uh, last year was a great year for um, a fall warbler favorite, uh, the Connecticut warbler. Uh, a big, chunky, skulky ground warbler. They have incredibly uh, strong and powerful legs because they spend most of their time on the ground, unlike most warblers, which um, are mostly arboreal. They spend a lot of time in trees. So um, Connecticut warbler definitely stands out. They kind of look like common yellow throat, like female or immature common yellow throat, but the um, this uh, solid eye ring here uh, really stands out, as well as yellow throughout the bird's belly and under the tail, whereas yellow throats kind of, the, the yellow kind of stops right at the throat. And again, those incredibly strong, powerful legs, and um, they're a lot bigger than common yellow throat as well. Definitely helps them stand out. Another look at the Connecticut Warbler. Uh, my best look at an American Bittern right in downtown Baltimore. This is at Patterson Park. And um, I've only seen glimpses of American Bitterns before that, but this one was posing in the open for me. So that was, that was incredible to see. Here we've got a red-breasted nuthatch posing wonderfully on this lichen-covered branch. A quick look at a couple landscape photos. I unfortunately have to go through them very quickly. Um, Davis, West Virginia. Go there. It's amazing. Um, this is at Blackwater Falls State Park in Davis, West Virginia. Um, it's hard to beat the fall foliage. And this is walking distance from the lodge that, that uh, I was staying at, as was this. Just, just absolutely gorgeous views. Um, here we have another uh, big rarity. Um, this is a curlew sandpiper. It likely uh, migrated um, way out of range, possibly from Siberia. Um, and unfortunately, this bird did not make it, but um, was an incredible find at um, Swan Harbor Farm Park, which is a, a great park to find rarities um, up in uh, Harford County um, near Aberdeen. Um, Really, really cool place, and some amazing birders that are up there uh, constantly checking for cool stuff. Here we've got a clay-colored sparrow. This was at uh, Kenilworth Park in D.C. Next to the aquatic gardens, there's some good sparrow habitat next to a track um, by the soccer fields that can yield some, um, some interesting sparrows every October. So here we've got a clay-colored sparrow. And some really good looks at palm warblers as well at the same park. Back to Swan Harbor Farm Park, I believe maybe less than a month from the Curlew Sandpiper, another cool rarity showed up. Uh, this is a mountain bluebird. Um, and as you can see, they look drastically different from the eastern bluebird. They have more of that kind of electric blue and gray. I believe this is an immature male. But with that fall foliage background, it's, it's really neat to see a bird like that. It was a lifer for me. Um, and here we've got a barnacle goose that showed up in D.C. I believe this was the first barnacle goose ever recorded in D.C. proper. And it was associating itself with Canada geese here. Um, the Canada goose is wondering, um, you don't quite look like me, but I guess you're cool. Here we have a uh, western flycatcher um, that... Uh, showed up in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, there was another one that was in Baltimore, I believe, um, but it's actually impossible to determine which exact species of western flycatcher it is. Um, you'd need a DNA test, so that was actually attempted, but I don't know if we ever got any conclusive results. Um, most likely a Pacific Slope flycatcher. And here is a, uh, a bird that uh, probably got here from Europe on its way to Africa and took a wrong turn. This is a northern wheat ear that I had to drive all the way up to central Pennsylvania to see. Um, I saw it right after I uh, saw that um, western flycatcher. So sometimes I'll combine two birds in one trip if I can. Um, and so this bird... Uh, was obviously a lifer for me and just to see it in in the habitat it was in it was kind of in an industrial park which is so so weird to me like I'm sure the bird was wondering like 
where the hell am I? Which is exactly what I thought when, when I went to drove three hours to get to Central PA in a agri, in a um, industrial area. My first bird of 2021, January 1st, 2021, a beautiful male painted bunting. Yes, this is the famous painted bunting at Great Falls that got all the media coverage, though I believe we had, I think, maybe nine other painted buntings that showed up in the region. Um, they are uh, fairly common winter vagrants. I say common uh, relatively. Um, as you're not going to expect to see them, but but let's say that they're more common than some of these other rarities I was showing you, mountain bluebird or northern weed ear, but definitely more common than those. Again, I think we had about 10 that were in the area. Um, I got this pretty much like the day or two after the painting and bunting, so 2021 started off with a blast. I've only got a couple more to show you here. This is a green-tailed towhee. A pretty cool sparrow that's from uh, the um, American Southwest that showed up in uh, Fauquier County, Virginia. Um, and it's a pretty uh, skulky bird as well. And you can see kind of the habitat behind it that it's typically undercover in brambles, but will eventually make its way out if you're patient. Last bird for you. Here we have... Um, this was uh, a really cool hybrid that was spotted by someone... Um, in Baltimore County and uh, it's actually it's it's called a Sutton's warbler but really it is a hybrid northern perula and yellow-throated warbler uh, but the really interesting thing was that it, it was a pure perula song so it sang um, a northern perula song which means that if it does attract a mate it would likely attract a female perula um, but that was uh, I don't know if I'll ever see one again so that was really cool to see that is from this spring so that is um, one different warbler that I had to at least share the photo of. Well, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, bearing with me. As I know I had to go through a lot of photos for you guys. I'm sure it was overwhelming. Um, but um, I hope you did uh, keep in mind some of your favorite shots or something that you would love to ask a question about or comment on. Um, even the hard questions, seriously, bring it on. Um, this Q&A session, I want it to be as engaging as possible. So let's make it discussion-based, and I hope that many of you will stick around to participate. Um, either way, I hope you have a great rest of the MOS convention this year, and I hope to meet many of you in the field. Take care.